Good morning, good morning. We got something. <clears throat> well, I started to finish the chapter, <clears throat> and when I got into this part of uh, Luke, and I found myself with some terms that I really did some research on, and it got me fascinated, so I didn't quite make it all the way to the end of the chapter. <laughs> so we're only doing, uh, basically I'm calling Sons of Thunder. Uh, this is more or less about a situation in Samaria that uh, got uh, James and John their nickname. And uh, at first I thought I'd do it real quick. We're moving into uh, the uh, third part of the, uh, of the uh, book of uh, Luke. And it's a section that, uh, uh, starting here in verse 51 of chapter 9, Jesus is going to start working his way towards Jerusalem for the final event of uh, his ministry, which of course is the death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, and uh, then, of course, Luke kind of sets up for his sequel, uh, better known as Acts, after that. So we're going to spend the next few chapters, and I have this cool little uh, uh, outline, kind of, that I found. That I thought I'd share, give us an idea of uh, the rest of the study of Luke. Well, let's start with a prayer first. Dear Heavenly Father, I uh, just want to praise you and thank you so much for this time. Uh, we get to look at your word and uh, find out more and more about you. Uh, get to know who our, uh, our future king is going to be like, uh, that we can serve you uh, faithfully and know as much as we can about you while we're here on earth. And we look forward so much to that day that we get to uh, be with you in person. Uh, and we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So it ended up just being, uh, starts out as a rejection at Samaria. That's kind of interesting how James and John uh, kind of react to it. But let's take a look at this outline real quick first. In this third, third section, uh, my little outline in my, uh, uh, it's in the, actually in the E sword. Uh, they kind of break down each book into sections. In this section I call the rejection of the Son of Man, uh, the rejection of Jesus. So as we move forward, he's going to be uh, decreasing in popularity uh, to be, get ready to be crucified. I think that's almost necessary because, uh, of course, uh, he's doing it for our good. But he knows that in order to get the uh, religious leaders of that time frame. Excuse me. Don't know what caused that. That... Uh, uh, that he needed to be able to be in a position where they had a reason that they wanted to eliminate him. Uh, and uh, so that uh, he's going to be causing some strife. And we're going to see there's a lot of great teaching, though, uh, in the next. And this section here uh, is called the Rejection of the Son of Man. It basically runs from Luke 9.51 through chapter 19.27. And this section, this first part of it, uh, is calling the increasing opposition to uh, Christ. Uh, he's become popular now, so that uh, religious leaders are, are really not liking it. Uh, they are feeling their uh, their power being, uh, as they see Jesus become more and more popular, uh, they're starting to lose their power, and they don't like that. But it's actually going to set up a jealousy in, their, in the leadership of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Pharisees, the Sadducees, that are going to... Uh, be a hindrance uh, to the ministry. So Jesus has to be uh, maybe a little bit more careful about where he's at. He needs to be able to fulfill prophecy at certain periods of time. So uh, he does a lot of teaching uh, during this period and not as quite as much uh, healing, uh, public healing like he was doing. Well, he does do some, of course, uh, like we, we still got the story of Lazarus that was just before his crucifixion. And there's still other things, but uh, uh, where he spent a lot of time healing lots and thousands and thousands of people uh, during uh, the period of time coming up to this, he's going to back off in that a little bit and spend more time teaching his disciples, I think. So in this outline, 
uh, from here 951 until 1154 they called it, they named it the increasing opposition to Christ and we got some things like we're talking about today Samaria rejects Christ uh, the true cost of discipleship uh, he sends out 70 disciples to start uh, evangelizing we'll see that at the beginning of chapter 10 the lawyer test uh, Christ and uh, Mary and Martha are, con are contrasted that story there about Mary and Martha uh, good lesson there I uh, Christ is going to teach on prayer Christ is rejected by religious leaders and religious leaders are are rejected by Christ rejected by Christ so that's this next section we'll get into the next couple of chapters so I think you might find that kind of interesting and so let me get uh, my next picture is up Let's see. Actually, I'll probably just switch to the differences to the other display for now. And that way, uh, the bottom won't won't correlate. Uh, it'll actually match what's on the other screen, but it's a little easier to read. And uh, I'll go back to the other screen when I get to some pictures I want to show you. First, let's do some reading. On the rejection of the Son of Man. And uh, so it starts Jesus' journey toward Jerusalem. And we'll start reading here in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And there's two terms here that really got me fascinated. Uh, well, I know what received up means. Uh, and I thought it was kind of, when I first read that there, because uh, we're only about halfway through Luke. You know, Luke is like 18, 19 chapters, something like that. Uh, so I was wondering uh, why it seemed like we were already talking about him heading towards Jerusalem. But he gets going to spend a, uh, most of this middle section. That's what got me curious about the outline of Luke. There's a lot of teaching involved. So it would be a really interesting study on uh, Jesus himself and, and how he thinks, I think. So I'm kind of excited about it. But he said, but two terms here got me received up and set his face to go to Jerusalem. That term set his face, uh, it uh, it carries, uh, I found it used quite a bit and I was trying to decide what it meant. Uh, well, first let's talk about received up. Received up basically is talking about him, his final destination is to go back to heaven uh, after the resurrection. And so that's basically what he's talking about there is received up. I thought I'd just show some verses on that. Uh, Luke 24, 51 is when it actually happens. And it came to pass when he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. But uh, just some other turn, other times that this was actually used. We actually go all the way back to 2 Kings uh, with Elijah, uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, uh, that uh, Elijah, uh, Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. This is the prophecy of the fact. And then it happened in verse 11. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a carried of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up with, by a whirlwind into heaven. Other examples of uh, basically a rapture. Uh, over in Mark 16, 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into the heaven and sat on the right hand of God. So we get to know here what received up uh, really means. This is Jesus speaking here in John 6, 62. What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. That's an interesting verse too, that, uh, uh, that uh, basically that Jesus realized that his, uh, that he, he came from heaven to become a man, and now he's going back. John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them that unto the end. Again, just more terms about this uh, uh, departing out of the world. And finally, over in Acts 1, 9. 
And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So all verses about uh, what we were talking about there and verse 51, where it said that uh, he was should be received up. That's what uh, the term there means. Now he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Set his face. That, that's another term that got me a little curious. So I found some other references to it to try to understand what it meant. And over in Luke 7, 27, this is Jesus speaking. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. So that's a reference to John the Baptist. Uh, and so that uh, John the Baptist was sent in front of Jesus. Uh, ba so basically before Jesus. So you can almost see that the, when it makes the uh, term the thy face, uh, it's talking about doing something uh, ahead of uh, Jesus. Also in Luke 10, 1. After these things, the Lord appointed another 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, for that he himself would come. Uh, so that uh, basically that 70 we're going to talk about in chapter 10, uh, he's sending forth to places that he's going to visit. So before Jesus actually went there. Uh, again, Malachi in 3.1, going in the Old Testament. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Even in Genesis 31, 21. So he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over the river and set his face toward the Mount Gilead. So again, uh, heading off for a destination. Numbers 24, 1. And when Balaam saw that he had pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. So I guess this is basically to make a decision. Uh, to uh, to do something in preparatory uh, of a uh, event that you're going to be, be doing. Second Kings, twelve seventeen. Then Haziel, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. And Haziel set his face to go up to Jerusalem. Uh, kind of another copy of what Jesus is doing. And finally, in Daniel eleven seventeen, he shall also set his face to enter with the straight strength of his whole kingdom. And upright ones with him that shall he do and he shall give him the daughter of women corrupting her but she shall not stand on her side neither be for him uh, that's later on in daniel when we start when we get back into the jewish portion of uh, daniel in the sunday school class uh, looking forward to getting back into that next week uh, so that uh, we can continue with daniel you might want to uh, brush up we'll be uh, for those that uh, are watching uh, we'll be uh, going back in, and I think we're at the beginning of Belshazzar, and the handwriting on the wall uh, is where we're at. And so that's where we'll be heading in Daniel, uh, kind of a preview for this coming Sunday. And it's also uh, Friend Sunday, so don't forget to bring some friends. Okay, back to Luke 9.52. So, and he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into the village of Samaritans to make ready for him. So here's another example. Jesus sent a couple of disciples ahead to Samaria uh, in order to, uh, to prepare to arrive there. Now, this story is kind of interesting that, uh, that Samaria rejects them. And so that's what uh, I'm going to spend a little time talking about. Uh, verse 53. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So there's still this animosity that uh, that happened all the way back in the uh, uh, when the kingdoms were divided. Back when God was passing judgment, uh, he took the northern kingdom, and actually they were conquered by Assyria, and it, uh, they were dispersed all over the place, and they became intermarried with a lot of different cultures. When they came back, the Jews of uh, Judea, uh, were, which were more pure, uh, in as much as they didn't intermarry with other, other cultures, uh, were in Jerusalem. So there became this animosity between Samaria and Jews and Jerusalem based on that uh, issue. 
But remember that uh, uh, Jesus himself went to Samaria. Uh, and we're going to touch base on that real quick. That was over in John, the famous woman at the well. And I'll just briefly go through it here, a few verses. Uh, John 4, 26. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Uh, Jesus is speaking to that Samaritan woman at the well. I'm not going to read the entire story. It's pretty much the whole chapter of 4 of John. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with this woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? So here the disciples are actually wondering why he's talking to a Samaritan. Like I said, the Jews and the Samaritans are like mortal enemies of each other from more of a social standpoint than a uh, legal one. But uh, I mean, uh, a, Jew, a Jew would avoid Samaria by all cost. John 4.28 and the woman then left her water pot and went into her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? <coughs> <coughs> and I'll just jump down to verse 39. It talks a little bit more about it. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever did. And so when the Samaritans would come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. So I find it fascinating that uh, you can see Jesus was there for two days and had quite a bit of success. But all of a sudden, uh, this animosity uh, that we saw in the first few verses of John, uh, I'll just read those in John 4, 40 through 42. So when the Samaritans would come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Well, that's more of a repeat. And said unto him, now we believe not because, okay. Yeah, it is a repeat. I'm not sure why I put that there. But anyways, uh, what I wanted to, uh, the reason I'm uh, getting into this is because here we got to sending somebody to Samaria again. And now they won't receive him. Well, what's fascinating about this story is, well, is how James and John uh, uh, handle it. And so uh, when we get uh, in Luke 9.54, uh, uh, well, back to 9.54, we see here that, uh, uh, <laughs> that James and John... Uh, want to uh, because of their uh, of the fact that the Samaritans now are uh, don't want uh, Jesus to come there or they don't want the Jews to come there. And I uh, read verse fifty four here. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, "Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did?" Well, this is where they got their their nickname that Jesus had given them. Uh, and uh, I found this fascinating, you know, the nickname, you don't see it in Luke. It's uh, mentioned over in Mark 3.17. Uh, and Jesus makes, uh, and here it's made reference that Jesus at some point gave them this, uh, this nickname. And here it says, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. And he summoned them uh, Born Bornegas, which is the sons of thunder. Uh, so he surnamed them the sons of thunder. Uh, because of this incident where they wanted to call down fire on these people that were that were picking on them as being from uh, from Jews and heading to Jerusalem. So they mentioned calling down fire like Elijah did. So I thought I'd show you real quick where that was. It's over in 2 Kings 1, 10 through 14. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and the 50. There came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Here Elijah is calling down fire from heaven and killing these people. Again also, uh, he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, 
O man of God, thus hath the king saith, come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from the heaven and consumed him and his fifty. This keeps going on. Uh, verse 13. And he sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on the knees before Elijah and besought him. The whole reason that, uh, that Elijah keeps doing this is he knew, he found out earlier uh, that these men actually had a, an idea of, of killing him uh, while they brought him back uh, to the king. And so uh, basically Elijah was protecting himself uh, from, uh, from certain death. And finally this final uh, captain comes with his 50 and bows down realizing that the other hundred or so uh, got killed by uh, Elijah. And so finishing up here, came down and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50, thy servants be precious in thy sight. And behold, there came fire down from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. So uh, and at that point, uh, Elijah does go and meet with the king. That's where the term came from that, uh, that uh, James and John had mentioned. And I bring this up because I found it fascinating that uh, I remember once I was looking for pictures of, uh, of, uh, of John. Uh, I was think I was doing Revelation or something. And I couldn't believe with some of the paintings how they depicted uh, John uh, as this as this really kind of feminine-looking person. Uh, so I thought I'd show you these pictures, anyways. That uh, this is how some of the pa uh, the uh, the painters of that of that time frame of the uh, depicted, well, actually of the Middle Ages back when like when the Catholic Church was becoming popular and coming up in strength and the Catholics were really big on uh, on uh, on painting pictures of well-known characters in the Bible and here's some of the pictures they actually painted of of, of uh, John and let me, let me get back to the beginning here here's some of the paintings actually and it makes it makes John look like this really fine-skinned uh, very uh, uh, you know, almost a uh, little bit of a feminine uh, look to him. And I couldn't help but think about that when you when you look at this term that Jesus nicknamed them the the sons of thunder, uh, and it gives you that idea that these guys are really kind of like uh, gruff and uh, you know almost a little bit uh, antagonistic, uh, very strong-willed people. And if you really understood, uh, I grew up on the East Coast. And so I was in around fishermen all the time because uh, I actually worked at a company that processed seafood. So we had a, we had a couple of boats that would dock near uh, where I work, and I saw fishermen all the time. And if you ever met them, they're kind of a gruff group. Uh, when you're somebody that's out on the seas all the time. Uh, you get this really rough appearance. Uh, you don't actually uh, uh, typically your skin is very weathered because you're out in the out in the weather all the time with storms and being pelted by rain and uh, all kinds of things. And so you don't have this real kind of uh, uh, smooth skin look about you. And I just found it fascinating that they would depict them that way. Because this is more like what I see as a fisherman. <laughs> uh, this is an actual picture someone took of uh, what the uh, disciples would have looked like possibly uh, during that uh, time they were going across the Sea of Galilee uh, in a boat. And it, uh, and, and this is exactly what, how I would picture a fisherman. Almost all fishermen have beards because when you're out on the water in the wintertime, it's very cold and the, and, the, and the water is biting cold when it hits your face. So almost all of them would have a beard. Uh, and, they, and you can see that they are always wet. Uh, it's not a very glamorous lifestyle. So I always, uh, so this is the kind of John I envision, whereas uh, I found it fascinating, those pictures of of the John that uh, some of the uh, early church fathers depicted him as. So when you see this uh, this term, Sons of Thunder, I couldn't help but uh, there's another picture of some fishermen, actual fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, probably a better idea of, uh, now this is more like in the 1930s, I think this picture was taken uh, quite a while ago. Uh, 
In fact, it's in color. It might have been a little bit later than that, but uh, or it was colorized. But uh, that's how I would depict a typical Galilean fisherman uh, of Jesus' time. So I wanted to kind of point to that and the fact that they, uh, they Jesus nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. So back to what we were talking about before, and uh, I'll leave I'll leave this picture of uh, the fisherman here. You know, that uh, it's probably very true of uh, what. Uh, what James, John, Simon, and Peter actually, I mean, Simon, Peter, and uh, uh, and Andrew actually looked like as a fisherman on the, uh, of that time frame. So anyways, uh, I mentioned that Sons of Thunder and, uh, and what Elijah did. So back to Luke 9.55. <clears throat> now this is Jesus talking again. But he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. And speaking of spirit, I uh, thought I would make mention of uh, uh, the type of spirit. If it was the spirit of Christ, I found a couple of verses that really explain it well over in Romans 8, 15 through 17. If you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, if you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, the whole reason Jesus came uh, during this time frame again it was to actually it was to uh, start the ministry to be uh, to begin the church period uh, and to uh, uh, and its main reason was to die on the cross for us uh, to be our sacrificial lamb and uh, and that he came to save man not to destroy them. Continuing in Romans eight fifteen and sixteen, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him and that we may be also glorified together. So that uh, Jesus is going to go on here in a minute and, and continue to say that the reason he came was to save mankind, not to destroy him. Uh, also in 2 Timothy 1.7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So back to Luke 9.56. Jesus continuing, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So they, uh, they bypassed this area of Samaria after being uh, attacked by the Samaritans and just decided to go elsewhere. And again, uh, this is again starting that period of time when Jesus was uh, being uh, under more persecution. And we got to realize, too, that, uh, that Satan is in the background here. Uh, he's, he's manipulating people to try to make... Uh, Make it so Jesus never makes it to that cross and does what he needs to do to to gain control of the world back. As we uh, as we see in Revelation, when Jesus actually uh, gets the title deed to the planet back, uh, that right now is in the uh, before before Jesus died on the cross, Satan had control of this uh, within reason. I mean, God still had control, but Satan was uh, had uh, basically the deed of the. Uh, of the uh, world, and that Jesus had to get it back by by being our perfect sacrifice. <clears throat> okay, so uh, <clears throat> so that's basically all. That's where I'm going to leave off, and I thought I would leave off with just some uh, great advice, so a little bit of an explanation about uh, why Jesus was here and what his mission was uh, from some uh, other verses. And over in Luke 6, 27 through 31, as a refresher, this was the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, and again, these same disciples heard these. This is the uh, famous, uh, uh, oh, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. It's where the, uh, uh, yeah, Jesus had that big, long, uh, actually in uh, Matthew, I think it's like three chapters, uh, Sermon on the Mount. But they call this one Sermon on the Plain. Remember we talked about it. But some of the verses out of it kind of explains exactly where Jesus stands on some of this stuff. But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, 
offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to them every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as we would that men should do to you, do you do ye also to them likewise. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, do unto others as you want them to be uh, to do unto you. Then we go over to Romans, uh, and Paul mentions here, do be not overcome uh, of evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is basically what Jesus is telling James and John is that uh, no, I'm not going to fire. You know, I get the impression that somehow when they came to Samaritan, that these Jews were mocking them and telling them to leave, and that they weren't being very nice about it. Uh, maybe they were swearing, and uh, and so. Uh, that's why I kind of depicted the typical fisherman is uh, uh, we always hear that about Paul a lot. I mean about Peter, uh, basically open mouth, insert foot, and then uh, oh, actually the other term is ready, fire, aim, uh, Peter. It means he'd open his mouth and start speaking before he really realizes what he's saying. Uh, and uh, speaking of Peter, this is what he wrote in his epistle. Uh, after he got the Holy Spirit, he became a whole new, different kind of person. For even unto here unto you were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. We did no, no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reveal, reviled, not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. So what Peter's basically saying here is this, in this incident here, he's not going to uh, use fire and brimstone to uh, to attack these people because his whole reason for co coming was to save these people. Uh, and so that uh, uh, and it teaches us to think twice before we uh, want to attack somebody that has a, a different opinion about us. And I am definitely guilty of this. Uh, I've uh, The more I study the word, the more it bothers me when people... Uh, blaspheme God and and do things that uh, I think are very uh, not just uh, that God wouldn't like, but that uh, it's starting to bother me more and more that I see so much of things that I know bother God in the world, and uh, and I almost want to go out there and kind of uh, just shake people and say, hey, yeah, you know, you you're really upsetting God right now, but uh, can't quite do that. Uh, you got to do it with a uh, spirit of uh, of uh, loving kindness. And uh, and that's something I'm still learning, but uh, I'm also starting to realize uh, what what must be like must be like for God to look down on us. I think it's kind of like a father in, in his in his children, as he watches his children come up, uh, grow up, and they get into their teen years and early twenties, and they think that uh, you know they know it all and they're they're perfect and that uh, uh, that they got the whole system worked out. <coughs> And uh, as a father, uh, you know, I have uh, adult children and I see them making mistakes and I almost want to, I almost wish that I could convince them to listen and, uh, and not commit them. But pretty much uh, it's live and learn sometimes on some things. And uh, I think I see God that way too. He loves us so much that uh, he's looking down on us and he knows that we're going to make mistakes. He knows that we're going to mess up, uh, that uh, he needs, and he's very, very understanding about it. And he knows where to draw the line and what he needs to punish and when he needs to do correction. And so we got to be open for that. But that uh, I can get a sense more and more what it must be like for him uh, to look down and uh, and see people not listening to him and causing problems for themselves. And there's nothing he can do about it because he gave us free will. And so uh, it must really hurt him. And so on that note, though, Let's have a prayer, and that's all I have for today. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, yes, I do understand. Uh, it must be really tough, Lord. I'm still learning myself, and I make a lot of mistakes, Lord. And, uh, and I thank you so much for helping me to, to see the things I need to correct in my life. And Lord, uh, 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 we continue to strive to get to know you and get to know uh, what it is we need to do to try to change and be uh, better children uh, to uh, to take your advice and to uh, really listen and we hope you help us with this Holy Spirit to help us to uh, continue to strive uh, to uh, to be good uh, good children for you 
And we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So on that note, uh, we will try to finish out the chapter tomorrow and, uh, and go from there. And so uh, I hope you have a great day. And uh, I will talk to you again tomorrow.